I think that uh, we're live. Ah, uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Hi. How are you? I'm very good. And yourself? Thank you for having I'm me great. today. Uh, I'm great. I'm really, really happy. Thank you for accepting our invitation to actually join us for our Facebook uh, first Facebook Live series. Um, and um, I would like you to briefly introduce yourself to our audience, to the people that uh, are watching us. And after that, I'm going to make a short intro for everyone who's attending this live. That's great. Thank you so much. So, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dimitra. Uh, I'm the managing director of Talent Consultants. So, we are um, an HR business supporting um, businesses uh, across the UK uh, for uh, HR transformation, organizational development, and uh, work uh, workplace uh, culture uh, incentives. Um, and we are here today to discuss about um, a very challenging topic about skilling and reskilling workforce. Uh, yes, actually, uh, the reason that uh, we hosted this live today is to discuss about the change that's coming. The change in the workforce is coming and the workforce knows it. 61% uh, of people out there believe that global trends greatly affect their jobs and they will actually continue to do so. As a result, many people devote significant time to refine their skills. The, the vast majority are also willing to learn new skills to become attractive candidates to completely different jobs. On the other hand, we have people that they're trying to get and acquire new skills. So today, we're gonna explore and talk about reskilling and upskilling, which are two major trends that uh, affect the industry. We're going to discuss about how big is the problem and if there's a problem, what does it matter? What's the role of career pathing to actually to, to the whole setting? And also, what are the dynamics of learning agility, of micro learning? And finally, we're going to close on how companies can adapt to this learning, but also how individuals can adapt to these new models. So uh, I would like to pass the floor to you, um, and it would be great if you could explore and discuss to us what are the definitions of reskilling and upskilling, what are the differences, and also give us some small examples on, uh, on those. Well, uh, that's true. Uh, we are living uh, in, uh, you know, in the start of the fourth industrial revolution, and everything will not be the same again in a five to ten years' time. Uh, organization uh, will uh, completely change uh, the, um, the business setup and you know all all jobs and uh, structure will be reconsidered so um uh, reskilling and upskilling now uh, starting with reskilling uh, we're talking about when the job is not relevant anymore so as as you said like more than 78 uh, millions of jobs are going to be uh, changing um, and uh, what essentially uh, reskilling means is changing the skill set of your of your team so employee skill set needs to be updated to respond to the needs of the of the new jobs it's estimated that 133 million jobs are going to be generated um, as upcoming automation and digitization are coming in the uh, working environment so training employees to move them into roles with adjured skills in order to cover future position is going to be the new uh, way forward so an example on that is, for, for example, um, someone who's an expert in cryptocurrency, um, a technology that is not going to be relevant in a few years' time. Uh, the organization will look to see what are the adjured skills uh, that he uh, can be moved to um, a role that is related to. Another, an example is uh, blockchain. Uh, blockchain. It's um, a technology that is close to cryptocurrency. So this person can uh, actually um, take the, the skills already have in place uh, based on his expertise and retrain in order to respond to the um, skill set required for do, uh, the blockchain. Um, to join the block um, chain uh, uh, work. Um, so reskilling can be undertaken by employers. So employers can launch proactive initiatives to determine what skills need to be um, 
um, uh, are going to be essential for the coming years uh, in order to create the learning uh, incentives for preparing the staff uh, to join these new um, roles, to move into these uh, roles. Uh, when, on the other hand, we have uh, upskilling, which is um, prepare staff to develop uh, and um, achieve growth for both organization and uh, career development. So the term upskilling refers to the expansion of people capabilities and employability to fulfill talent needs in uh, this changing environment within the organization or outside the organization. Um, as a reskilling, upskilling involves training, but in a different perspective. So th in this case, we keep people in the same roles rather than fundamentally changing um, the skill set for joining new roles. So we prepare these people to grow into organization, offering most probably a career path in order to move into re leadership roles or move um, vertically or horizontally um, in the organizational structure. So upskilling programs, um, most recently, uh, we have identified that focused mainly in soft skills. So we see a trend in, in businesses try to upskill staff around critical thinking, decision making, leadership, how to manage others and uh, advanced uh, data um, analysis. Uh, so they're able uh, critical moments of changing uh, like this one we have recently with COVID to make the right decision and um, uh, be able to, uh, the organization to be uh, resilient and have leaders in place that they can uh, navigate um, the change. So, um, coming up, you would say that from what you say, that in um, one, the first one that has to do with upskilling is actually the willingness to adapt new skills for current positions. And uh, on the other hand, skilling is the willingness to pick up new skills for a completely different job. Yeah, and it has to do both with um, willingness and, you know, how essential it is. Yeah, and how essential it is because, for example, Organizations, they have three ways to go. Either, for example, lay off existing staff and hire externally, which is not the trend at the moment and is not that cost effective um, uh, or time efficient, or it's difficult to make sure that I can find, that you can find in the market the right fit for the job, understand the culture, uh, make um, the time to prepare for induction training uh, and make sure that this person is going to respond to your business objectives. Um, uh, so so it's, it's not more likely to go in the hiring route. Uh, when we yeah. have upskilling and reskilling, so in, in the sense of uh, in the matter in the, in the sense of reskilling is about is essential for people to be willing to uh, take on board new skill set in order to move to um, relative to their existing jobs or to completely new jobs in order to survive okay, into the organization or the changing market because it's not something that is happening solely in an organization. Uh, and then upskilling is offering people um, and people be able, obviously, and, and willing uh, to adapt and uh, join a route of growth so they will grow within the organization and they will personally benefit it uh, for a career, um, a career change uh, within career the business or, or yeah, make it, yeah, make, make, get some skills that will help them grow into more senior roles, if you like. And um, I would like to, uh, to keep something from what you said, because you mentioned the COVID-19 uh, circumstance and uh, I would say that the COVID-19 pandemic created an urgent need to make labor shifts happen uh, much more quickly than it happened. And um, I've seen many governments have focused on providing special un unemployment benefits to laid off workers. But we have seen that also this is not something new. In the past, uh, consumer demand has dropped dramatically. We have seen reductions in the workforce in some companies that they were absolutely inevitable making unemployment assistance a necessity. So there has been a huge opportunity, would say someone, instead of challenge, to rebalance demand and supply for labor at a very, very critical time. So 
what's your opinion on that? Do you believe that COVID-19 at the end of the day is a challenge? Um, it's something that uh, it, it can rebalance the whole labor market and how you believe that it can be done all this? How can this be achieved based on that? So excellent question, thank you. Uh, so for my experience, I have seen most uh, medium large organizations have been, you know, try for long to apply transformation uh, and it, it you know you, you drag you have a transformation program in the specific function or a specific function or you know in the wider business and you know delays in project resistance from stakeholders human uh, incapacity and budget restriction have made the, the journey long so people and companies knew that the, this um uh, you know, change will will happen. Digitization is not something that happened like 2020. It was in the pipeline, but COVID-19, it's when it happened, it gave that pause into the system in order, let's say, force the changes and reconsider and do the decision making that need change need to apply right here, right now. So we've seen business medium size or large size trying to do all this um step by step um transformation and transition but what is actually required sorry and then the wave came and yeah, made everything exactly and overnight we've seen people you know business that didn't have the infrastructure in order to um have um you know, um, flexibility and mobility around remote working. Suddenly, uh, you know, they did uh, the 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 input put in place um, the the digital uh, tools, uh, the IT, and the security required to allow people working from everywhere. So it's it's magic what it can happen when you force things or there is an urgency uh, things to happen rather than you know waiting you know, find an excuse about internal or external stakeholders to put your um, transition and transformation um, on hold. Yeah, and um, we mentioned earlier that after discussing about what is reskilling, what is upskilling, someone would say, how big is the problem? And uh, does it really matter? So uh, stepping into that, I would like to say that drawing from average reskilling costs, uh, I read somewhere that 1.37 million workers were projected to be displaced fully out of their roles in the next uh, decade, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, may be reskilled to new viable similar skill set, meaning and um, desirable higher wages, growing roles at a cost of uh, 34 to 35 billion. So we understand that on average, this would entail approximately. 24,000 uh, per displaced workers. So when it comes to the government perspective now, we also find significant evidence of a really quantifiable return in addition to broad, broader societal good. And I say that because one of the main issues that all the businesses, as you have seen and as I have seen, um, one main challenge that they have is that they cannot quantify things like the return on investment and the return on investment on training initiatives or in recruitment practices and all that. So the fact that now we have a quantifiable return in addition to the, this broader essence is the first time that this changed a little bit the scenery. For example, with the set of assumptions applied and with an investment of approximately 20 billion, only the US government could reskill 77% of its workers and they could be expected to be displaced by technology into growing jobs while generating a positive return into taxes, into lower welfare payments. So we understand that this is a huge issue, reskilling. This is more, uh, this is more urgent than ever before. And I would say that talking about organization and return on investment i would like you to explain to us how career pathing works in terms of reskilling and upskilling because if i want to train someone and retrain <laughs> someone or upskill someone i cannot just leave him on some training initiatives that don't have beginning um, ending and all this uh, design in between 
For example, if I don't have the KPIs to know that someone has been truly reskilled or upskilled, what's the result on that? So I would like you to discuss a little bit more on this, on the career pathing and the importance on reskilling. Okay, so you are absolutely right. It's a very complex issue because it's um, the, the cost involved, uh, it's humongous. But what I would like to, before I move to a uh, career path, what I would like to um, introduce uh, here is like, we indeed the cost is, is um, it's a big cost, it depends of, of course on the size of the organization. And um, however, if we think the associated cost with not reskilling, upskilling, but into higher externally, we need to take in consideration the severance pay that we're the severance pay that we're going to pay people that we lay off, um, the uh, talent, um, you know, demands in matter of salary, the time and the cost is going to take us um, while uh, we recruit, and to make sure that we have made the right decision. Uh, in order to make sure that we have the return, uh, return on investment um, when we have paid all this money to um, allow people to uh, leave our business and to get um, on board. And also the impact that this has to the other people, to the other employees and to the, the team, Absolutely. because sometimes we focus on the people that we lay off, but we forget that the employee morale of all the other people that stay behind is actually directly infected. Absolutely, because it's it's about it's about culture, and you know it's it's a great uh, you know um, bridge in order to get into your point uh, about the uh, career um, uh, path program that organization can use uh, as a mean of uh, upskilling, um, and how um, what I mean about that is. Uh, Part of a talent management strategy of the business can be a career path program where slowly, slowly uh, allows the upskilling of people without being uh, forced by attending a specific course or be in a classroom or take, him, take them away from work for, for long. For example, uh, if um, a company has a learning initiative for um, 10 weeks, for example, this will take the person out of work for all this period and there is, is going to be an additional cost um, for the business in order to find a substitute in order to cover uh, this position. When, when you have a career path uh, program in place, it allows you to uh, evaluate and assess employees' competencies at the moment allow you to think how your business strategy will be in uh, five or ten years time and you can map um, the jobs that we're, you're going to need and understand the skills required for those future roles. Then you can design the right development plan for employees you have right here, right now uh, and link their competencies to the future competencies, uh, competencies in order to, uh, you know, um, design the journey step by step to move into those new position. And coming to, to culture, this is uh, exactly the benefit that an organization can take having a career program in place. So create a culture of talent mobility, uh, which allows people to stay and add value to the business, being committed and enhance you know, retention and enhance productivity because people are going to be engaged because they feel they have uh, career opportunities. And also secure, businesses also secure uh, business continuity because they're going to have um, a workforce where it is resilient and can respond to change because they will have, have invest to those people gradually. Okay, and um, I would like to um, ask you, you talked about engagement and um, you really believe that this is highly connected also to turnover rates? I mean, having in place some programs that are um, directly connected to the training, upskilling, reskilling, and all the stuff have to do also with uh, people staying more in organizations, being more loyal, being more admired. And then we'll get back to the question that I see that we have, that 
It's what kind of skills uh, should workers focus on building or rebuilding to future proof their careers? So let's, re let's reply to that later on. But since you mentioned uh, the engagement part, this is something that we, we have been receiving a, wee wee a lot this month. How I'm going to keep my people engaged, and especially in a period that everyone is working remotely, everyone is distanced, mm -hmm. everyone has receiving pressure from many different uh, um, parameters outside of their scope. So how can I keep my people motivated and engaged? Do you believe that career pathing can assist on that? 100%. I mean, uh, the talent requirements have changed. Uh, and we, organization, need to understand that. Uh, I, I will uh, <clears throat> refer a bit to the trends that we see in, in generation into the workforce at the moment. So we see some difference in um, behavioral traits uh, of, of talents at the moment. So generation Y and Z, for example, uh, are looking um, to more disruptive attitudes than we're looking at the past. They're looking for independence. They demand the workplace to, conf to conform their needs. So they're willing to work hard, adapt to change. However, they expect in return to be rewarded and be part of organization, looking for inclusiveness and for career development opportunities. So this is exactly what employers have now to respond. This is how they're going to engage, understand their talents and understand the, the the future talents, the, the people, the candidates that are going to on board uh, and what is that they're keep them motivated, uh, what they're going to keep them engaged uh, and uh, what opportunities, what they have to, to, to gain, um, you know, in order to offer, um, you know, their knowledge, their energy, uh, their time uh, into, into that business. So, some, you know, it feels like it has been the other way around. It's, it's not like the employers now that they, they decide. Employers now need to offer more uh, and employees is to make the decision who is the employer that offers more to cover my needs. So 100% uh, an employer that offer career um, development opportunities and um, offer growth. So a lot of people that they have expressed, for example, the willing of um, cross-functional um, training skill set. Oh, uh, yeah, so they're, they're interested to see how the organization work as a whole. They're keen in order to uh, learn new things. They're curious. So, for example, a person that were um, that has been in, in marketing for 10 years and they see that they enjoy now um, analyze data from um, customer behavioral change. Okay. Or and, HR. Sorry? Or HR, for example. That's right. That's exactly. why we have seen employer branding rising as part of marketing and being exactly. integrated in marketing department. Exactly. So you can jump from um, a marketing department to go and, you know, um, work with HR and help them or learn more about people analytics and how you can make a strategy in order to be uh, to build an employer branding so you have the the the, the, manage, the sorry the marketing skills and now you're going to get some more insights about HR and you can build something new so it's yes. absolutely uh, a way of um, engage uh, your staff through a career pathing absolutely uh, definitely. And uh, I said that we had a question from uh, Laura. Uh, that's why I was trying to find the question. And it has to do with that even if my people actually have the skills, I think that that's what I read. Uh, if my people have the skills right now, are, are they going to have the skills for the future? And what are the skills for the future in order to combine the question of our pre previous uh, guest? But in order to make a small bridge on that, I would like to add to what you said, the, the two really, really important parameters on that. First is the power of purpose, and the, seven, uh, and the second, the importance of the ecosystem. And I mentioned that because all involved actors in this, uh, all the shareholders, uh, are actually overwhelmed by the power of purpose. And this is important to understand because 
given how complex is nowadays the attention span and the learning and the learning preferences and everything and the overarching <laughs> nature of reskilling, no individual or no industry actually are capable of managing this challenge on their own. So, yeah, I see the question um, on, on our screen. So I would say that the most important thing for companies or for individuals is being part of a learning ecosystem because a learning ecosystem is something that you can share, you can exchange knowledge and you can actually invest on what we're going to discuss later on, on micro learning because every person learns in a different way and every person has different learning agility and learning adaptability. So when you're trying to draft and create a learning program, you should take into consideration not only what kind of skills do your people have, but what is the style of your people in learning. So um, I'm reading Laura's question, which is even if some of my people have the skills they need for the future, are they good and up to date enough to cope with the rising needs and demands of the future market? Um, would you like to start and uh, work on that together? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in my opinion, you sh as an organization, you have, uh, you know, as I said, the uh, responsibility in order to uh, see, have uh, a structure in place in order to see where you want to be. So. Uh, in the future and take in that journey uh, your uh, employees. For example, uh, you need to consider and understand uh, the skills that you need in a matter of, for example, you, you need to run a, diagnos a diagnostic, okay, to show which skills the workforce possess. For example, Laura, Laura now knows that her uh, workforce possess the right skills uh, for the uh for, for the for the moment but does she know exactly what uh, her um organization would would look like in the future and she has mapped out the skills that um she require for the job that she will um have available at the moment if she has so she needs to decide across um the whole option she has the actions they need to take in order to address the, these gaps. For example, it's necessary to design which specific programs or initiatives to implement to gain the right skills uh, in the workforce, to know your people in order to design the right programs. And also, something we we, we speak before, it's this decision also include, you know, who I'm going to reskill and upskill first and to why. Uh, so, if, for example, uh, Laura sees that for her, her urgent needs is to upskill um, or reskill uh, the, the bottom line or the production line. Uh, she, she needs to have a plan in place in order to see if she's going to completely bring an external um, uh, learning in initiative or design uh, as part of her learning and development strategy, um, uh, a course or um, a simulation or um, send people to um, university or to get a new certification uh, or have a program, career path program as we discussed before, in order to make this transition um, and, you know, more, uh, more to, more. To, yeah, to, to the future because having a career path allows you to go and revisit Okay, the action that you have um, taken before. Go to one off learning uh, modules and incentives is something that is probably relevant for the five uh, years, but it's not relevant to uh, in 10 years time. So career path though, it's you know a continuous learning journey that you can go and revisit um, you know, uh, from time to time and see where the employee stands now, what new skills has acquired, where we need to go or what we need to consider and use that as a pilot phase as well. You don't need to go one off. You need to have, you know, like, uh, you know, a small you know, bite size, let's say, you know, learning. That, that's why, from what you say, I understand the importance of having in place tools and uh, tools by which you have psychometrics that gives you the opportunity to actually diagnose what are the areas 
And uh, we say diagnosed because of the last years we have seen a rise in a very specific term um, considered learning agility. Uh, the, the last years, organizations are looking for employees who not only perform well at their current job positions, but they are also likely to perform well in future positions. But not all the people are actually scoring high in learning agility. There are people that they are less adaptable to new um, technologies, to new things, to new ideas. So it's really important that the continuous changes in the nature of work and working environments of today, the challenges organizations are facing have to do with who are those individuals that they have high potential in this specific area. Uh, learning agility is a skill that it's needed to effectively lead others during times of change like now that we are facing COVID and uh, we're facing the transition from the typical type of work to the remote work. So I would say that also it's really important. Consequently, organization might assess learning agility to identify individuals who have the potential to succeed in future positions as it provides organization with an objective and, uh, and more, as I mentioned earlier, quantifiable measurement of actually individuals' likelihood of success in COVID because that is all about, that is all about the likelihood of someone in succeeding. It's the predictive validity of actually achieving some things. So in any case, it's not about the skills that you possess because something that is a misunderstanding is uh, I do have soft skills. Soft skills are something really volatile. You may be assessed now and you're scoring really high in decision making. And after six months or one year, I may assess you again and you may be scoring lower because you were in an environment that didn't help you grow. So this is something really that people should understand, the volatility of soft skills and why is it important to have a benchmark before trying to begin everything. Um, we are, um, I think we didn't respond to the question that ah, we just received another question. What can leaders do to acknowledge and value the effort people put into working on their skills? A very nice question. That. <laughs> a very, very tricky one. Uh, would you like to set the scene on that? Uh, yeah, actually, you know what? Is, um, I'm going back a bit to upskilling and reskilling. So, an organization that really uh, value and consider their people as an asset um, and, op and obviously have calculated return on investment because I totally understand organization are not charity, okay? Uh, but, you know, there is this philosophy and this culture that if you have a people-centric culture and you prioritize uh, to set, to create um, a strong corporate uh, culture uh, and, and using reskilling and upskilling for closing the existing gap. Uh, this allows business con continuity, achieve goals, be competitive, respond to market de demands, and at the same time, uh, you know, build in, in your people. And um, so it's a uh, yeah, it's 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 very important, and I think it has to do with the the the, um, the mindset of of the business, and um, it's prioritizing people. So it's it's what um, uh, uh, Bronson says that uh, you know it's like I take care of the the employees to take care of your customers. So it's 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 investing in your people. I think is what um, makes the difference, and you know make make people uh, want to. Uh, stay and grow within the business. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And um, getting back to the question on that, I think that what can people, leaders do to acknowledge and value the effort? It's actually to tie, to tie down the effort and the learning initiatives with something tangible because uh, it, only learning for the sake of learning, it's really important. But at the same time, I think that it makes more sense if someone is acknowledging the fact that you're trying and put an effort to become better and better, if you give him the initiative to actually try and apply this knowledge inside the organization. So an, an interesting case where there's room, of course, for this implementation would be companies that are applying intrapreneurship, meaning the entrepreneurship initiatives that are taking place inside the organization. Mm -hmm. So 
it would be an interesting idea, I think, trying to get all this knowledge acquired by people and try to implement that inside the organization in order to solve uh, solutions, uh, in order to solve problems that the organization might have. Because I feel that if I'm attending some courses online in Coursera or in Udemy or anywhere else, and uh, if I have the opportunity to actually try and use them practically in the organization, in the role that I'm working, I would feel that this would be the best acknowledgement of this knowledge because I would see them in practice. You're absolutely right. And you know what, what leaders can do is, as you said, acknowledge and at the same time uh, communicate communicate get to know their people so if you know if you go to a meeting and you sit down and just you know you know revisit the objectives and what kpis have been met or not met is not a very constructive uh, conversation that you can have your own employee in order to help them uh, understand that you know you care for them so having you know a constructive conversation around what are the opportunities, what what well you have seen um, in in his performance, what what he can do inside the organization on the side of his day to day skills and project, or how he can champion uh, in another um, area of the business uh, and help them grow is something that a leader can you know create a path consciously or you know subconsciously to a person uh, you know to take the motivation uh, you know create this learning agility you said because people that they're learning agile looking seeking for op opportunities of learning learn something new so if a leader understand your potential uh, try to lead you that way try to give you ideas encouragement communicate that to you right so it's 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 a great opportunity having a meeting have you know performance um appraisal not to be very traditional and you know very um uh, uh let's say and um an example for example what uh, we were doing uh before covid uh in uh, we we is that uh, we were choosing something we were choosing a reading that everyone uh, was accepted by the whole team and uh, after that, we had the specific time to read this specific uh, book or this specific um, issue. And then we were brainstorming all together once per month how what the knowledge that we acquired, we could implement it in our solution. So this was kind of uh, brainstorming, team building, but at the same time, cross-checking, learning, uh, exchanging mindsets. And um, we saw exactly. that it was something that it people liked it, uh, they liked doing that on their own without us. And I see that an initiative can be measured if it's good or not by the fact that if there are people are initiating and continuing without you being inside the team or not. Exactly, 100%. Great, great example, I agree. So if people enjoy what they're doing, uh, it's not, it's going to be part of their routine. They're going to take that break within the week to do it themselves or even brainstorm in order to do with something bigger with that rather than, you know, just continue the flow for the sake of doing it. Totally agree. Yeah, great initiative. It was something that uh, we were doing and I've seen another ex other examples from uh, some CEOs that they were, they had the, um, gathering books and they were trying to have some discussions, a breakfast with their people on uh, what they're reading recently, what's their opinion, what's their option. I mean, it's not normal, it's more rare, but uh, I, I've seen it sometimes. I see a question from Chris. Um, are there any tools that we can test our employee skills before interview? Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> great, great question. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so absolutely. I cannot talk about that. I cannot talk. <laughs> so absolutely. But I mean, like, it's not fair for me to talk about that because, I mean, I can start. I can start talking about it. Yeah, it's it's absolutely um, very, it's absolutely important to test, uh, you know, employee skill as an employer, but it's great um initiative from employees to try and understand themselves better uh, and try to to test themselves um uh, uh, in in a different uh, areas um 
in order what they can offer to, to an employer and what they need to uh, develop themselves. And the same applies to the employer. Uh, what are the skills that required apart from technical skills, the soft skills, and um, what are the, the existing staff uh, a skill set that they need to be developed in order to respond to this changing environment, um, uh, in order to upskill them to. It's, it's a great, uh, great um, uh, way of um, exploring where you're standing in order to move, as, as we said, in order to decide, decide uh, and design a plan, you need to know where you're standing at the moment. And I think we, we has um, a way to do that and offer to the market something very special, Athena. It comes, it comes, it comes to my mind. Uh, but uh, generally, it's a, it's a great question, and I like the bridging that you make because um, it's really important that for everything that you would like to assess, there are tools out there. Yeah, if you want to assess cognitive um, skills, uh, you should refer to cognitive uh, tests. If you want to uh, assess personality, there are so many personality tests also out there. Uh, so it's really important knowing what you want to assess and in which way. And I say that why. For example, in our case, we are doing game-based assessment. So if you are just posting a job uh, in your site or a job board or everywhere, and you're talking about a very innovative job position and an innovative company, fast growing, no stuff, you cannot have a recruitment process that it's very, very old fashioned, by, but at the same time asking for innovative people to join you. You should offer this innovative experience from the beginning to the end. So it's really important before choosing which tools you want to actually use to have in mind what I want to assess and in which way. Because, for example, for some industries, uh, gamification may be something really extreme. Uh, for other industries, it's a must because you cannot go somewhere very, very innovative and not using innovative methods. So there are many tools. Uh, of course, for me, one of them, the best one, but <laughs> I would say that uh, generally for every customer, for every client, it's different. But we haven't replied to William's question around um, what are the skills for the future employee, or I would rephrase it, what skills are actually demanding right now and what do employers ask from the employees of the new uh, generation or the new era? Or if I could tie it out, I would say, what are the skills of also being able to work remotely, maybe? So the main skills gap that have been identified at the moment are around technology and soft skills. Uh, the, the, and, um, it's and across the industries, but for sure, some indust uh, industries are more affected. For example, if we see in the manufacturing industry, okay, 20 um, million jobs are going to be uh, changing, um, replacing by automation and um, robots coming into workplace. So this is something, this is some new skills that uh, manufacturing industry need to bring uh, in place and learning incentives that needs to take in place in order to allow people work alongside with machines when in, the, in another industry it's different kind of um uh, of learning and different kind of skills uh, or we're talking about upskilling and you try to uh, grow and develop your people in order to have a succession uh, plan in in the business and career path as we said we need to train and focus uh, into the the soft skills um and um the trend show, for example, in the market that uh, in US, for example, uh, software related job has been increased for the last year, 6.5%, um, while in uh, uh, Europe uh, last year, uh, 500,000 position, it was related with technology, have been, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, have been uh, stay uncovered. Uh, so it's it's a massive gap around uh, technology and uh, soft skills. People, you know, organization um, uh, suffer from lack of soft skills, and this is a trend that 
they have been identified and something that, that has been mentioned from a lot of CEOs across the globe, that they equally value the train, the training around digital uh, technology and technology and around uh, soft skills. It, a very good example that comes to my mind for that, uh, that someone could understand for the people that they listen to us is uh, marketing. For example, we have traditional marketers who used to deal with traditional marketing memes and campaigns, and uh, we, we all know that. And now, in order to actually upskill their career, they, sh they can jump into digital marketing and learn how actually digital skills are helping and boosting their careers. So that's why we see many traditional marketers trying and having courses on digital marketing, on SEO, on things that are arising. But you cannot just having the, as you mentioned, the technical skill, all the hard skills uh, acquired, bulletproofing your career for the future. I would say that the perfect combination is acquiring the, the hard skills in order to do the job, but at the same time work a lot on the soft skills like resilience, like learning agility, like adaptability to new environments in order to actually not only survive, but thrive in your new role. Exactly. Um, I still have a new question. Uh, do, can you see the question or shall I? Um, I would read it out for all the people that are watching us. How important is behavioral and economic science in designing tailored training schemes in a work environment? And is gamification based on this? Very nice question, very sophisticated one. So I will leave the gamification part to yourself, but what I would like to say is, uh, is very important organization, uh, organization uh, have tailored made um, learning um, uh, schemes into, into the, uh, their uh, business organization because it's, it's, it's about what they need to achieve what people and what culture they need to have in place. Uh, so it, it's like it's not one size fits all um, approach. It needs to be um, very uh, specific and precise because we're talking about your objectives, your achievement, your positioning into the market. So uh, the learning should be tailor-made, uh, if not innovative as, and, and special, um, in order to uh, develop and send the, your people in the right direction. But, um, and adding to that... And about uh, Sorry, uh, no, not only to that, to the first part about the behavioral and the economic science in designing tailored training schemes. Um, I, I was reading a report recently about, uh, from Boston Consulting Group, and I think the, the answer to that is to this report. This report was saying that they found substantial regional differences in people's willingness to learn. And this is really the key to the question. Accordingly to this uh, survey, actually we have many, many different uh, groups of people in terms of behavioral analysis and how they learn. We have the proactive adapters that we, are people in countries like Nigeria that actually uh, proactive adapters believe that the trends in learning will strongly affect their employment and that could explain why they already spent significant time on learning. But we also we have the bystanders, we have the hesitators and the intrinsic learners. All those are categories that are connected to behavioral and economic science, of course, because if you want to create training schemes that they're based on these specific regions, you should take into consideration the behavioral aspect, how those people learn, and if they're bystanders or proactive adapters, and the economic science, of course, behind that, because it's really important, the economical background of the countries that you refer for the training schemes. So okay. if the, the gamification is based on yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, um, no, it's the capacity and the culture play a vital role. That's absolutely it. Of course, the, uh, the, the willingness of business in order to invest in learning, Exactly. And um, I would say, based on that, that, the gamification is not based on that. The gamification is actually the means to an end. For example, when we have intrinsic and extrinsic learners, gamification is actually the mechanism that boosts a little bit more 
the intrinsic and the extrinsic learners. It's the method that helps you actually digest the learning and not uh, the solution to everything like that. I mean, gamification cannot solve your problems. Gamification is the experience that actually makes the whole onboarding and the whole engagement loop uh, more attached to what you want to achieve for goals. Um, yeah, absolutely agree. It's about, it's about employee experience. Uh, and, and it's very, um, you know, crucial uh, to offer that when you want to, um, uh, you know, assess uh, skills around both learning uh, agility and about the um, specific job. And if you are the right fit for the organization, which is important. Um, can you say that we have a, a last question? Uh, yes, but I cannot really read from my monitor. It's too small. I can read it. So, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, after the age of 35, people are less likely to be motivated to upskill or reskill, which is absolutely true. So, why would a worker be motivated to be reskilled when she or he doesn't have the time or the money, and when she or he can anticipate whether the skill they will be acquiring will make more marketable their profile? Well, it's a great question, but I, if you allow me to disagree uh, and say that the ability to learn uh, is not that after an age you cannot learn new things, uh, it's most likely you don't, you're not motivated and you don't have the energy because you're focused in other uh, areas in your life, uh, but I strongly believe, um, and studies have shown, to my to my knowledge, that adults of any age can learn new skills, and that people that are, are aware of this principle and they share uh, this uh, belief, they become more capable in order to uh, become lifelong, uh, embrace lifelong uh, learning. So that those continuous learners. Um, and also, again, if you have the right tools and practices, everyone can master anything. You can um, you can make people um, that they are now in in the age of uh, sixty, and they have like um, you know few years of employment. And the technology uh, when they start their job that exists today, it was it was not existing. Not even internet existed at that point, <clears throat> but if there are the right approach, okay, and we see at some sometimes, you know, uh, we're we are inclusive and we are, uh, you know, really embrace diversity in the workplace. We have programs which allow people uh, to to learn in their own pace, in their own way, uh, the, the skills that they need to acquire. So I, I, I believe that people are able to learn if they are in the right mentality, or there is the, the environment in the organization that foster that and not force that. Yeah, I, I mean that it's really important because people. I believe that it's not that they are really motivated. I feel that it's it has not been communicated properly to them. The yes, of that. Of course, as I mentioned earlier it is really really important to understand that based on the region and the cultural aspect people learn and upskill and reskill on different paces and with different ways uh, people generally in more western societies um, they upskill and reskill in many many different ways and they are more um, passive learners so this is something that we should have in mind instead of more eager learners so i strongly believe that this is, has to do with also what is the labor market that you refer to? How competitive is it? How the market is being influenced by all the rapid changes? Because in addition to developing skills to stay competitive, uh, the majority of respondents generally worldwide are willing to learn new skills. But they don't know if they can do it on their own, if they need something structured, if this is going to be valued. And by the, at the end of the day, am I going to lose my time or not? But the answer of that is that nowadays we have access to information. 
and it's not something that it it really costs. I mean, we have there are so many initiatives that they don't cost and they're for free, like Coursera courses that you only have to pay for the certificate at the end. So I would yeah. say that it begins and it ends from how organized are the initiatives from the government, from the society, from the company that they belong in. Because a person as a person, it's not not only um, a, being, a human being that is not affected by external parameters. You are affected. You believe that you won't be appreciated and that's why you are not motivated to learn something new. If you knew that you would be appreciated for your skills and this yeah. would help you accelerate your career, you would do it or you would do it easier. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, as, as we discussed earlier, it's, it's about uh, understanding where you want to go, if, even if you are an employer, even if you are um, an employee. So if you have career aspiration, if you have ambition, if you were um, a seeker of new opportunities and new learning, um, you are the person that are more likely uh, to go and, and look for opportunities inside or outside the organization and look for the employer that, that can offer that. And organization with the right um, and culture and that they want to invest in the people because they believe that they can add value uh, to, to the business um, are more likely um, to invest uh, in um, upskilling and reskilling staff in order to um, move to the new paradigm. Yes, and um, so I would say that summing up what we discussed today because we are uh, uh, approaching to closing our session, I would say that if we don't have also other questions, uh, summing up today, we discussed what is reskilling, what is upskilling, what is the difference with uh, skilling, and some examples on that. How big is the problem, and how much is affecting the whole industry and the whole economy around us? How important is career pathing in that, and how companies should actually adapt to the new environment, but also how job seekers and uh, people, uh, employees are can adapt to that. Also, how important is the combination of getting hard skills, but also soft skills like learning agility in order to thrive to do in this environment? How important are cultural differences, behavioral economics, as was mentioned, in crafting programs and training initiatives? But also, at the, at the end of the day, how important is the whole motivation and engagement in terms of the companies? So I would like you to make it also closing around what would you like to let our people know and what would you like people to have in their mind in closing? So what I would like to say is uh, it's that I admit that we have uh, an exceptionally complex uh, issue around upskilling and uh, reskilling. It's, it's true. Is equal uh, importance, uh, both upskilling and reskilling. Uh, but the, uh, at the end, um, uh, at the end, it's, it's about the talents that should adopt the, the mentality of continuous learning in order to thrive and survive, become adaptable and develop learning agility and also organization um, to, create, if that, to create that culture, that environment, uh, invest in their people and no need to do everything at once, a step-by-step -step approach organized uh, with respect to um, both uh, in and out the organization uh, for um, sustainability and um, meeting their objectives. Um, thank you so, so much. Uh, I would like to say for the people that they're sending us on the chat that uh, uh, keep uh, stay touched with uh, our Facebook page because I'm going to attach for your reference uh, one or two reports that we mentioned in our discussion like Harvard Business Review surveys and Boston Consulting Group um, survey that was run in terms of reskilling and upskilling. So in case you find it interesting, you can also find the material there. And also take a look in our page for our next live next week about the topics. And for any other questions you may have, feel free to shoot in our uh, events page. Take care and see you soon. Thank you so much for having me. Ciao, ciao. Thank you so much. Bye.